The story begins with Neofumi traveling in a carriage pulled by Philo. He's thinking about how he ended up in this world as the shield hero, destined to fight against dangerous events called waves that bring destruction to this world. These waves are stopped by guardian beasts. The spirit tortoise, one of these guardians, recently revived, so it will be a while before another wave comes. Neofumi believes these guardians use soul energy obtained from harming people to prevent the waves. They defeated the spirit tortoise, and the next guardian, the phoenix, was supposed to revive. However, the energy they took from the spirit tortoise created a barrier, delaying the phoenix's revival by three and a half months. Neofumi plans to use this time to make his land safer. He also remembers that when they fought the spirit tortoise, a curse was placed on his party, affecting his, Philo's, and Raffia's abilities. Neofumi and his group make a stop and notice that the army gathered to deal with the spirit tortoise is still there, along with the Phi Country's army. Neofumi wonders why Phi's army is present, especially if they didn't come to fight the spirit tortoise. He also can't use a special power called the Liberation Aura since the curse incident. Neofumi realizes that all four cardinal heroes must trust each other to become stronger. The scene then shifts to Neofumi finding out that the other cardinal heroes are missing. The queen explains that the three cardinal heroes dealt with the wave that happened after Neofumi and his group arrived in this world. However, they might feel responsible for what occurred, which is why they're missing now. With the phoenix about to revive, having even one hero missing is a major concern. The queen asks for Neofumi's help again to protect the land. Neofumi expresses his intent to do so. He also wonders about the queen's plans, as three nations east of Fabry are causing trouble for her country. The queen reveals that after the spirit tortoise battle, Phi stationed its forces nearby under the guise of relief efforts. This made the three neighboring nations cautious, and they positioned their forces nearby too. She mentions that Melamer and that nation are allies for now. The scene then shifts to Raffia, and the others in the castle, where some people are unhappy to see them. Melty arrives and apologizes to Raffia for their behavior. She explains that their nation used to worship the three heroes but now worships all four. However, some people still dislike the shield hero and the demi-humans. Melty mentions that her mother wants to remove them from their positions, but these men were highly trusted by her father. Raphelia tells Melty not to worry, and Neofumi asks the queen about the seven star hero's whereabouts. The queen explains they should be somewhere out there, but they can't contact most of them, and they're investigating. The only one they know the location of is the staff hero, who is in Melamer. Philo and the others find out that Melty is preparing to leave for Se, which is close to Neofumi's lands. Philo is happy they can play together again. Melty mentions that R, another hero, is struggling to rule her lands, and she needs Melty's help. She's packing to leave today. The queen spy, who has contact with Neofumi, works as a mate for Melty. The queen gives Neofumi a piece of the spirit tortoise's body, and he unlocks a new type of shield that can make medicine. The queen informs Neofumi that Philo's sister has gone missing, and was last seen near the northern border. She warns him to be cautious as she may be planning something. Neofumi then visits the weaponsmith and shows him the gear they used in their previous world. He wants it adapted for use in this world, especially since Raffia performed well with it. Neofumi suggests the weaponsmith come to his lands to sell his weapons, offering 30 silvers a month. The weaponsmith says he makes more staying where he is. Neofumi goes around town in his carriage and notices that even though people here may now worship all four heroes, their looks towards him haven't changed. Later, he meets the slave trader and notices that the trader has fewer slaves. The trader explains that since Neofumi is trying to bring back the villagers of Lalona village, nobles and merchants bought all the slaves in anticipation of selling them outside the country. Neofumi is curious about how much it would cost to buy back the slaves that were taken from Lalona village. The slave trader tells him the current price is 30 gold coins per person, which Neofumi finds quite high. Instead of just buying a few, he decides to purchase all the remaining slaves and asks the trader for any information he has. The trader suggests that if Neofumi still wants the Lolona village slaves, he should head to Zabel. Neofumi prepares to go to Zabel after returning to his lands. Kill advises him to use a portal instead of the carriage. Melty explains that they can't use the portal to reach a place they've never been to and asks Neofumi to leave the training of the slaves she's taking care of. They set off on their journey, and during this time, Neofumi explores how his new shield works. Upon reaching Zabel, Neofumi notices that this country feels vibrant, and there's even an arena here. They go to the shop recommended by the slave trader and find that it's actually a tavern. Inside, they see someone who looks just like the slave trader, who turns out to be the other trader's uncle. He knows Neofumi is a valued customer, and invites him inside. The uncle mentions that while there are many enjoyable places above ground in the country, the real excitement lies beneath the city. 
He reveals a secret door leading to the city's underground and tells Neofumi that what he's looking for has just arrived. They head to an auction house, where they find a demihuman from Lalona village being auctioned. The slave trader explains that slaves forbidden in Melamar are sold here. Raffian notices that the demihuman girl is lying about being from Lalona village. Bidders start placing offers, and the girl is eventually sold for a high price of 100 gold coins. The slave trader mentions that this outcome is a result of Neofumi's ban on the slave trade from Lalona village. He adds that it doesn't matter where the demihumans are from, the Lalona brand created by the shield hero holds strong influence. The slave trader is disappointed that things didn't work out for Neofumi today but notes that he has solid information about a demihuman from Lalona village being in the city. He wonders about Neofumi's current financial situation and suggests that he shouldn't have spent all his money buying slaves in Melamar. Neofumi mentions that the slave trader brought him here, so he must have a way for him to earn money. The slave trader then mentions the arena above ground they saw earlier. He explains that while the daytime fights are fair, the underground arena is a different story, where people do whatever it takes to win. The potential earnings there are also much higher. Neofumi can either participate in the fights himself or bet on a dark horse. The scene shifts to Neofumi in the underground arena. He buys a drink and watches the ongoing fights. Right now, there's a battle between an elephant and a panda. A girl approaches Neofumi, noting that it's her first time seeing him here. She believes the panda will win and asks if Neofumi is here to bet or participate. The panda wins the match, and Neofumi buys the girl a drink. He inquires about the arena's rules. Meanwhile, another match begins between a demihuman named F and a noble named Yuji. The girl explains that participants can enter the arena alone or with a team of up to three members. The most popular matches to bet on are the three-on-three -three team battle and there are no strict rules here. The match between Yuji and F appears to be fixed, and Yuji wins. The girl mentions that even such things are allowed in this arena, and leaves. Neofumi then instructs his party to prepare for underground fights. They'll use masks to hide their identities. He plans to use the money they earn from winning matches, their bets, and prize money to buy back the demihumans from Lalona Village who are up for auction. The scene switches to Neofumi, and his team fighting against a group called the Topak family. They seem to be struggling. Philo asks Neofumi why they have to pretend to be weak, and Neofumi explains that by doing so, they can earn more money by betting on themselves if others see them as underdogs. Neofumi instructs Raffia to use illusion magic, making the Topak family believe they're in a tough battle. With the illusion in place, Neofumi's team defeats their opponents. They call themselves the Rock Valley and pretend to be exhausted, as if the fight was challenging. Neofumi then looks at the people in the arena, thinking they've successfully fooled them. The story continues, and Philo picks up a weapon dropped by one of the top members. In the arena, one guy advises Philo to use the weapon to win matches and promote it. Neofumi, disguised as Rock, realizes that the other guy was a sponsor. The announcer announces the next match for Team Rock Valley but notices that several teams have forfeited. He mentions that he will announce the names later. Neofumi, curious about the forfeits, is having a drink when the girl from earlier approaches him. She congratulates him on his first win and notices that he must be in need of money, given that he also placed a bet on himself. Neofumi worries she might report this, but the girl assures him she won't spoil the mood. She proposes they spend the night drinking together in exchange for her silence. Neofumi downs a glass of wine, surprising the girl with his ability to drink wine with rucker fruit in it. He says he can handle a dozen glasses. Neofumi then asks her to share what she knows. They head out into the town for some fresh air. They learn that it's standard to be informed of their next opponent right after the battle. The girl explains that if teams forfeit, they win by default and don't get matched for a while. Neofumi and the girl, Nadia, get surrounded by armed men who demand they die for their teams. Neofumi and Nadia fight the men, with Nadia using her powerful lightning magic to defeat them all. Neofumi realizes that people forfeit because otherwise, they risk getting ambushed in the middle of the night. Nadia warns Neofumi to be careful because their enemies will do whatever it takes. She hopes they don't have to face each other in the Colosseum and prefers that he gives up before having to fight her. Nadia then departs, leaving Neofumi to ponder the challenges they face. The next day, Neofumi notices that more opponents forfeited their matches. After that, they face some monsters, defeating them with ease. However, their illusion magic makes it appear as if they struggle. This illusion doesn't sit well with the sponsor and some of the audience, who aren't happy with Team Rock Valley's victories. With each victory, the prize money keeps increasing, and their illusion tactics make their betting odds better. Neofumi and his party head to the capital city's largest department store, recommended by the slave trader. They plan to get the armor and weapons they need for their matches. Philo also spots a lot of food, so they decide to stock up. 
While shopping, Neofumi meets the accessory merchant he once protected. The merchant recognizes Neofumi as Rock and reveals that he owns the store. He offers to invest in Neofumi, but Neofumi declines, knowing it would come with strings attached. The merchant proposes a deal, seeking joint rights to the economy of Neofumi's lands, but Neofumi agrees, at most, to let him open a store. The merchant trusts Neofumi's word and leaves. Rishia mentions that the merchant is famous and has a reputation for driving competitors out of business if he dislikes them. Later, Neofumi and his party are in an inn when Rishia informs Neofumi about their next opponent. This opponent fights alone and usually wins or ranks high in the matches. Neofumi suspects they are either strong or have a generous sponsor. Rishia reveals that their opponent's name is Nadia, known for using powerful lightning magic and a harpoon in battle. Rafia thinks Nadia sounds familiar, but dismisses the idea. Rishia notes that this will be the championship due to the many forfeits. Neofumi informs the team that they no longer need to pretend to be weak and encourages them to rest because they'll need it for the upcoming fight. The group prepares for the challenging championship match. The championship match begins, and the announcer asks the audience to predict the winner. The fighters enter the arena, and Nadia remarks that Neofumi should have heeded her warning. Neofumi explains that he has a specific reason for winning. Rafia, going by the alias Shigaraki, wonders if Neofumi knows Nadia. Neofumi mentions that they've had a few conversations. Nadia asks Neofumi if he aims to win to buy the slaves from Lolona Village, but she asserts that she won't lose to those who only care about money. The championship battle commences, with Rafia and Nadia using their weapons to duel. Nadia employs her lightning magic, but Neofumi deflects the lightning. Philo attempts to attack Nadia, but the arena gets covered in water. The announcer notes that the battlefield changed rapidly due to their speed, but Neofumi realizes it's the doing of Nadia's sponsor. Nadia believes her sponsor wants an entertaining show and decides to fight seriously. She then transforms into a killer whale, revealing herself as a demihuman. Nadia tries to attack Rafia, but Rafia calls her Sedina, and Sedina recognizes Rafia. She realizes that Rock is, in fact, Neofumi, the shield hero. Sedina confronts Neofumi, asking if he gathered the village's children for Raphelia and the villagers. Neofumi confirms her suspicions. Nadia suggests ending the fight and launches a powerful attack. However, Philo and Rafia combine their efforts to counter her and defeat her. Nadia worries that the sponsors might sell the kids from the village she was working hard to buy back. Neofumi reassures her not to worry about it. The announcer attempts to declare Team Rock as the winner, but he's interrupted. He explains that the sponsors decided to invalidate the final battle. Instead, there will be an exhibition match between the two participating teams, including a new fighter. It's now Nadia and Neofumi's team against the murder clown, and Nadia warns Neofumi that this new fighter is a bit dangerous. The announcer also mentions that betting will start soon, and they will refund the money for the finals right away. The unexpected turn of events sets the stage for the exhibition match with uncertain outcomes. The match begins, and the murder clown employs a spider net to catch Rafia's sword and a bind wire to capture Neofumi and Philo. In response, Philo transforms and kicks the murder clown, buying Rafia time to free her sword and attack. Nadia then asks Neofumi to cast a coral spell with her. Neofumi admits he's never done it before and wonders if it's similar to what Oz did. Nadia warns that Rafia and Philo are in danger if he doesn't act quickly. Nadia starts casting the coral spell while Philo and Rafia battle puppets controlled by the murder clown. Nadia and Neofumi cast a spell named Descent of the Thunder God on Rafia, but it doesn't harm her. Nadia explains they've given her a coral spell and advises Rafia to use it wisely. Rafia employs the coral spell to defeat the murder clown effortlessly. However, they discover it was a puppet disguised as the clown. The real murder clown appears and tells Neofumi that, according to her estimate, he has four buffs. She warns that this will be his downfall as his base strength is too low. She believes that if Neofumi isn't an invincible hero, the other world will destroy him. Confused, Neofumi questions what she means, and the murder clown claims she's fought enough to earn her pay before vanishing. The announcer tries to declare Nadia and Team Rock Valley the winners, but the sponsor intervenes. He states that this match is also invalid due to a major cheating incident. Team Rock used a fake name to place bets on themselves. The accessory merchant and the slave trader enter the arena. They declare the match in favor of the shield hero, who will receive both the fight money and betting winnings. The audience is shocked to learn that Rock is, in fact, the shield hero. The sponsor can't believe one of the cardinal heroes participated in an underground tournament. The accessory merchant also mentions that Nadia is the true owner of the Lalona village slaves, bought with her prize money, safeguarding them from being taken away. Neofumi is curious about why the accessory merchant is there and giving orders. The slave trader explains that the merchant owns the largest department store in the capital, 
Mayafumi is surprised to learn that the entire department store they visited earlier belongs to the merchant. Rafia is happy that everything worked out and talks to Sedina. Sedina notes how much Rafia has grown, and Rafia is pleased to see Sedina again. Nadir reintroduces herself to Neofumi as Sedina, and Neofumi introduces himself as well. Sedina expresses gratitude for Neofumi's protection of Rafia, and asks him to look after her in the future. The scene then shifts to Demiurge buying medicine from a doctor. The doctor hopes that Demiurge's sister gets better soon. Demiurge brings the medicine to his sister, Atla, and she welcomes him back warmly. The story continues with Fol giving Atla the medicine he bought for her, and he also gives her some bread for dinner. Then, Fol hears people talking, and he wonders if it's his sister. But he realizes that the voices are coming from outside. He overhears them saying that the Demihuman can't wait to be bought by the shield hero so they can escape from here. We see the slave trader showing some slaves to the shield hero, and on the way, some Demihuman slaves ask the shield hero to save them. The shield hero tells them that they can't trick him that easily, and the slave trader is impressed by his discernment. The shield hero then asks the slave trader what's happening here. The slave trader explains that in Siltville, the shield hero is not seen as a hero but as a god to be worshipped. That's why these demihumans came here to be bought by him. The slave trader mentions that the main attraction he promised the shield hero is this way, and he takes Neofumi to see Fol. Fol asks him to purchase them, and Neofumi remembers seeing Fol in the Colosseum. He asks for Fol's name, and Fol introduces himself. The slave trader mentions that what makes Fol special is his combat ability, and asks Neofumi to check Fol's stats. Neofumi takes a look and notices that Fol has a high level of 38 at such a young age. The slave trader adds that unlike other races, a white tiger can upgrade their class up to level 60 and can reach level 120 after upgrading their class. The slave trader says that when Fol gets older, he'll be very powerful in the world, except for the heroes. He tells Neofumi he can buy Fol for just 120 gold coins. Neofumi understands why Fol is valuable, but is confused as to what Fol is referring to. Fol explains he has a younger sister and asks Neofumi to take her too. The slave trader reveals that Fol's sister is sick, can't leave her bed, and is blind. She's not worth much, only 30 silvers. Fol fights in the underground Colosseum to pay for her food and medicine. Neofumi thinks the slave trader takes a big cut from Fol's earnings, and the slave trader acknowledges Neofumi's intelligence. Neofumi asks for Fol's sister's name, which is Atla. He goes inside to check on Atla, and she asks who he is. Neofumi introduces himself as the shield hero. Atla asks him to take care of her brother as she can't do it anymore. Neofumi refuses, but checks Atla's stats and realizes she needs the Yggdrasil elixir to cure her disease. Neofumi has the elixir and gives it to Atla. She drinks it and feels warm. Fol agrees to spend the rest of his life paying for it. Neofumi tells Atla she'll need to take the elixir several times for it to work and advises her to rest. They decide to take Fol and Atla with them. Later, Neofumi returns to his domain with Sadna and the other slaves from Lorelona village. A villager asks Sadna if they'll always be together, and Sadna says yes because she's in love with Neofumi. Raftalia asks Neofumi if he had a drinking contest with Sadna, but Neofumi clarifies that he only shared a drink with her. The scene shifts to the Demihumans building houses, and Neofumi notices there are more people in the village, but their defenses have many weak points. Melty says they need to strengthen their defenses quickly. Meanwhile, Atla keeps improving with every potion she takes. Melty realizes they need to start selling the bio plants and medicines seriously because they don't have enough money to build proper facilities yet. She asks Neofumi if things are okay with the new kids, and he says he doesn't know, but they can at least make money from trading right now. Melty clarifies she's not talking about money, they're like parents to a big family now. She mentions that Neofumi has been waking up early to cook breakfast for everyone. Sadna joins them and agrees that having more friends is good but warns Neofumi not to overwork himself. She tries to say something else, but Raftalia arrives and reminds Sadna not to bring alcohol while Neofumi is still working. The scene shifts to Neofumi removing Atla's bandages. Neofumi is glad they could do it so soon, and Atla thanks him by hugging him. Neofumi then leaves for Lorelona village to discuss trade routes and business, instructing Atla to practice standing on her own. The scene changes to Fol taking Atla for a walk. Atla wants to try standing up today, so Fol helps her, but she can't do it on her own. Fol thinks they've practiced enough for the day, but Atla insists on trying one more time and successfully stands up, making Fol happy. At night, an alarm rings, and a soldier informs Fol and others that they are under attack. Slavers have attacked Lorelona village, hoping to capture the valuable demihumans. They take a demihuman hostage and order everyone to drop their weapons. Heel calls the slavers cowards, but is forced to surrender their weapons. 
Fole and Atla manage to avoid capture. The slavers take the rest of the demihumans captive, thinking they can make a lot of money by selling them. Fole remembers that Neofumi told him the location of a hidden signal flare to contact him in case of trouble. Fole uses the signal flare, but a slaver captures him, believing he sent the signal. The slaver leader plans to use someone as an example for the others and tries to kill Fole. Just in time, Neofumi and his group arrive, using his shield to protect the humans. The leader wonders how they got there so quickly. Neofumi tells the slavers that they'll regret attacking the village. Raftalia and the others attack the slavers, and Neofumi orders them not to let any of them escape. He emphasizes the cost of repairing the damage they've caused. The slaver leader attacks Neofumi, who uses his shield prison to capture him and then releases him, instructing Raftalia to be ready. Raftalia removes the leader's armor, and he surrenders. She recognizes him as the one who kidnapped them before. Eclair, the Lord of Sade, arrives late and apologizes. Neofumi explains they were about to execute the leader. Eclair notices the noble family mark on the leader's armor, indicating their devotion to the worshippers of the three heroes. Neofumi wonders if they can't kill him because it would upset the noble, but Eclair confirms it. Neofumi decides they'll keep the leader alive and turn all the slavers into slaves. The leader pleads with Neofumi and offers to pay him as much as he wants. Neofumi tells him he can regret his actions for the rest of his life. He explains that he arranged with a slave merchant in Siltveld to auction the slavers, which turned out to be profitable. Melty is surprised that Neofumi could do this to a noble, and suggests he ensure no one seeks revenge. Neofumi assures her that he spread rumors when selling the slaves, making it clear that nobody should mess with their village again. The scene shifts to Atla approaching Neofumi because she can't sleep. She feels like she couldn't do anything during the attack and that she's always a burden to her brother. Atla doesn't want to spend her life being protected, she wants to be strong too. Neofumi assures her that he'll make sure they can protect themselves, and Atla promises to be the shield that protects him before falling asleep. Neofumi puts her to bed and asks Fol to watch over her. Fol tells Neofumi that he needs to get stronger, and Neofumi thinks they're similar. He mentions that he'll reset Sadna's level the next day and asks Fol to come with him. Neofumi resets Sadna and Fol's level so they can take advantage of his hero buff. The scene shifts to Neofumi in the palace, where he's preparing for the battle with the phoenix. He notices the former king refers to as Trash now. This person notices the blind Atla and asks for her name. Fole and Atla introduce themselves, and Trash leaves after seeing the queen. Atla mentions that Trash felt like her brother. Later, Neofumi asks the queen about this, and she requests to see Atla's face up close. She talks about the stories of the staff hero, whose name is Luge Lansar's Fabri. He abandoned his nation and named to become an ordinary soldier in Melamar for the sake of his beloved sister. He used his intelligence and strategic talent to gain fame and glory. However, his sister was kidnapped by Siltbell, and he was driven to seek vengeance. He ended up defeating their king, Tyron Gafeon. The queen then goes back to the main point, saying she called them there because they've located Madoyasu, the spear hero. The story continues as we see Neofumi is back in Leolona village where he recalls that the queen told him that Manoyasu is looking for his comrades who split up after the spirit tortoise fight. She mentioned that they know one of them is in a town near Melamar, but they don't have information about the others. The last known location of one of them was near the northern border. Neofumi wondered if the queen could use the slave crest to find them, but she said the person seems to be blocking it somehow. She confirmed that they have no information about the other hero's companions, but have verified that all of the sword hero's companions are dead. She stressed that the phoenix would soon revive, and she wants Neofumi to persuade the spear hero while there's still time. In the present, Neofumi has no intention of reconciling with these people, but he remembers that Fatoria warned him she would eliminate the heroes if they kept fighting each other instead of facing the waves. He plans to leave Eclair in charge of his domain and start with Madoyasu. Meanwhile, someone is watching Neofumi from afar, and elsewhere, the spear hero is searching for his comrades. The scene shifts to Neofumi doing his daily rounds around the village. Eclair and Elrasla are training the demihumans, and some kids notice Neofumi surrounding him and asking him to make breakfast. As Neofumi cooks, he thinks that everyone has settled in nicely. Melty mentions that the outer wall will be finished sooner than expected, but their problem is getting money for food and other things. Neofumi wonders if they can get help from the government, but Melty says it's difficult because all places are trying to rebuild. She asks how full and Sedna's level reset went, and Neofumi says they completed it. They need to do some rehab to make up for the lost levels, but what they gain from training isn't lost during a reset. Now they need to raise their levels for the battle against the Phoenix. The problem is what comes after they've reached their limit, and Raffia wonders if the only solution is more training. 
Nayafumi confirms that it is. Philo asks if the food is ready as she's hungry, and Nayafumi says it's almost done, asking her to play until then. Nayafumi serves breakfast to everyone and notices a new girl asking for breakfast. He asks her who she is, and she introduces herself as Asain. Philo mentions that she's the clown girl, but Nayafumi still doesn't recognize her. Asain shows her mask, and Nayafumi realizes she's the murder clown. Nayafumi wonders why she's here, and Asain says she's here to eat. Nayafumi tells her the food isn't free, and mentions he can't trust her. Asain leaves the village, hoping Nayafumi would stop her, but he doesn't. After breakfast, Nayafumi shows Philo her carriage and tells the others to raise their levels while he's gone. Eclair and Elrasla mention that they'll personally train Rishia. Nayafumi leaves with Raftalia and Philo, and Raftalia notes it's been a while since they've been on a journey like this. Nayafumi agrees and suggests they do some trading along the way. The scene shifts to one of the Spear Hero's former party member, thinking about how things turned out this way, while the Spear Hero watches her. Nayafumi arrives in a village and, after asking a fruit vendor about the Spear Hero, discovers that the Spear Hero was seen near a tavern on the town's outskirts. Nayafumi locates the Spear Hero, who is talking to his former party member, Alina. The Spear Hero is pleased to see that Alina is alive and invites her to rejoin his party to save the world together. Alina explains that this is impossible because she was compelled to take over her family's business and she no longer wants to travel with him. She mentions that his days of fame and fortune are over and he's now just a wanderer. Alina leaves and Madoyasu notices the Shield Hero observing him. Madoyasu quickly flees and teleports somewhere else. Nayafumi believes they should talk to Alina for now and asks her to share everything she knows. Alina explains that Madoyasu went to the Spirit Tortoise Kingdom to defeat the tortoise before Nayafumi. In a flashback, we see Madoyasu's party challenging the Spirit Tortoise and defeating the surrounding monsters. However, no matter how much Madoyasu attacked the tortoise, it kept regenerating, leading his party members to abandon him. Back in the present, Alina regrets her choice to be with Madoyasu and she mentions that trying to get her arrested won't work as she has already given all her information to the authority. Nayafumi then asks her about the location of the town's taverns and heads to one. He notices the sword hero, Ren, there, who tries to escape. Nayafumi assures Ren they're not there to arrest him. He asks Raftalia and Philo to find Madoyasu and gives him some alone time with Ren and the two of them sit down to talk. Nayafumi explains to Ren that he had just met Madoyasu and had come to talk to one of Madoyasu's old party members, but Madoyasu got away before they could have a conversation. Ren is surprised to learn that Madoyasu's comrades are still alive, while he remembers the deaths of his own party members. He defends himself, saying it wasn't his fault and that his party members were weak. Nayafumi expresses his sympathy for what happened to Ren's party but reminds him that he still has the ability to fight, and they don't have much time before the phoenix's seal breaks. He urges Ren to work together with them this time and tries to share what he knows about the phoenix. However, Malti, now known as Bitch, intervenes. She tells Ren not to believe the shield hero and claims that he had said he would only believe her from now on. Ren denies making such a statement, and he says that Madoyasu is still searching for her, but she says that the spear hero is not a true hero. Malti accuses the spear hero of forcing himself on her, just like the shield hero did and argues that the shield hero secretly controlled the spirit tortoise to gain people's trust. She blames the shield hero for the death of Ren's party members and emphasizes that she's not lying since her crest is not activating. She declares her unwavering belief in Ren, even if he can't believe in himself. Madoyasu arrives and wonders what's happening with Ren. Malti approaches Ren for help against Madoyasu. She claims that Madoyasu forced himself on her, threatening to harm her father if she refused him. However, Madoyasu insists that Malti is lying and asks Ren to trust him instead. This leads to a tense argument among the three of them, causing the shield hero, Nayafumi, to become frustrated. Nayafumi expresses his astonishment at the human capacity for lying and urges Ren to carefully consider who is more trustworthy. Ren, however, firmly believes that the shield hero is responsible for the troubles they have faced. He accuses the shield hero of being behind all of their problems, including the deaths of his party members. In response, Nayafumi states that he has something to say, especially if this is the stance Ren is taking. He emphasizes that Ren's comrades lost their lives because he treated their adventures like a game. Nayafumi believes that Ren's refusal to take responsibility and tendency to shift blame onto others led to the tragic deaths of those who followed him. Maltries intervenes again, denying any blame on Ren's part and urging him not to trust the shield hero. In response, Nayafumi loses his patience and tells her to be quiet or face the consequence. He emphasizes that Ren knows what he should do but is avoiding taking responsibility for his mistakes. Ren, however, remains resolute and demands that Nayafumi stay silent. 
He unsheathes his sword and attempts to use one of his skills. Mayafumi is taken aback that Ren is willing to engage in combat in a crowded location. Ren declares his intention to fight for Malt, the one who believes in him, and launches an attack on the shield hero. But Neofumi effortlessly deflects the attack. Inside the building, Philo and Raftalia observe the commotion. They worry about Neofumi's well-being. Ren then decides to use his teleportation skill to escape, and Madoyasu tries to stop Bitch but she kick him away. Raftalia and Philo express their concerns for Neofumi's safety, but he assures them that he is fine. Madoyasu, on the other hand, appears to be in shock following the events. The scene then transitions to Madoyasu waking up after having some drinks. He reflects on why such situations always seem to happen to him and decides that he will avoid interactions with women entirely. However, his attention is drawn to Philo, who is singing a song and dancing. Her performance touches Madoyasu's heart. Raffia, who is with them, is puzzled by Philo's behavior, and Neofumi speculates that it may be a skill she acquired during her time as a humming fairy. Philo offers Madoyasu some food, trying to cheer him up. In a moment of vulnerability, Madoyasu hugs Philo, causing her to become frightened. Neofumi intervenes and separates them, reminding Madoyasu of the training methods he had taught him earlier. He encourages Madoyasu to use those methods to become stronger and prepare for the upcoming battle. Madoyasu understands the advice and seems willing to follow it. As the group leaves the town, Rafia wonders if Madoyasu will join them. Neofumi suggests that Madoyasu may not be ready to do so just yet. However, to everyone's surprise, Madoyasu approaches Neofumi, addressing him as father. He expresses his gratitude for Philo saving him, and boldly asks Neofumi to give him his daughter. This unexpected request confuses everyone. Madoyasu then chases after Philo, who hides behind Reftalia. An argument ensues, with Madoyasu insulting Reftalia by calling her a raccoon pig. This incenses Reftalia, who retaliates by knocking Madoyasu unconscious. Neofumi, still puzzled by these developments, decides to continue his journey with his party. Madoyasu pleads with them not to leave him behind. This bring an end to our episode. If you enjoyed it then don't forget to like, share and subscribe to our channel for more anime recaps.